the globalisation we've witnessed since 1991 has been a very particular form of globalisation where it's basically been westernisation or Americanisation. And I just think that that has, just because of the new distribution of uh, people, resources, ideas, money, power, influence, uh, energy, initiative, uh, the world is so fundamentally different now. And, you know, um, the rest of the world is talking back to the West and saying, sorry, guys, you know, you, you, you don't define the terms of our conversation anymore. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm joined by two of my colleagues from the Multipolar Peace Alliance. I've got with me Jeff Rich, a historian and writer from the Burning Archive. That's the uh, publication that he's running on Substack. I highly recommend you check it out. And I have also Warwick Powell here, who's an adjunct professor at Queensland University of Technology and a senior fellow at the Taihe Institute. Uh, Warwick, Jeff, welcome. Glad to be Great here. Great to be with you. So we said we're going to do a meeting and an update on what's happening in the world and especially looking at the world from Australia, where both of you are located in, um, in, in the Pacific. So can I ask you maybe first of all, uh, the uh, how are these new wars that now have broken out in West Asia, how are they reported on your end, uh, Lebanon and this kind of boiling, simmering war with Iran? Um, how's the Australian media reporting on this? Maybe Warwick first and then Jeff. Oh, me, okay. Um, look, my stance is that the mainstream reporting is very much shaped by the um, the dominant transatlantic kind of framework um, which sees history starting on the 7th of October last year um, decontextualizing just about anything that's happened ever since and has largely struggled I think with um, presenting the problems of West Asia within firstly their complete historical context number one but also in part because of that um also being um, uh, institutionally trapped by the, 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 the politics of, uh, well, the politics of Israel. Um, and I guess we could explore this in a little bit more detail progressively, but the, the sensibility within the mainstream political institutions in Australia, together with the mainstream media, um, has tended to view the world largely through the lenses of uh, the uh, of, of a narrative that uh, uh, positioned Israel at the centre. Um, the the views and experiences of Palestinians are uh, much less understood. The voices have largely not been amplified in the same ways. But but the reality of what's been happening on the ground and the fact that independent media is so prolific these days has meant that the, the tragedy and the, the bloodshed and the horrors of what's going on in uh, West Asia are unavoidable and it's actually provoked uh, and and perhaps Jeff will have uh, a, a real sense of this and maybe I'm throwing him uh, under the bus so to speak uh, but I, I do get the sense that there's a lot of people in Australia uh, who are actually incredibly shocked at the the one-sidedness of the political reaction by the uh, by the political establishment, the absence of empathy to uh, the the peoples that have literally been uh, slaughtered um, to a point of being subject to a genocide, as the ICJ has uh, determined, 
And we are now seeing people march on streets. There, there is a vocal um, uh, movement uh, for uh, for justice to be achieved in Palestine for the Australian political establishment and institutions to actually respond with more empathy and with a greater sense to 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 what justice actually calls for, which is very different from the way that the mainstream media has been painting this story. I don't know if I've communicated that clearly. I haven't hmm. ever really articulated a view on it. So in a sense, this was a bit of a rough from the gut sense yeah, um, uh, yeah. I, I'd, I'd really like to hear Jeff's take on it yeah, um, to be too, honest I with think. you and and maybe I'll steal or, 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 or be inspired by his perspective uh. and, 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 and get my, my own sense across a little bit more clearly yeah well a couple of things I mean at an official government policy level there has been very very strong support for, I guess, the Israeli and US positions. So Australia has, you know, pretty um, consistently sort of lined up behind the US and all the votes and all that sort of stuff. And it has also been, uh, you know, made a lot of noises about, uh, you know, appropriate with appropriate concerns about, you know, anti-Semitism and, and all that sort of stuff. But then... Mm, tending to bleed into uh, labelling people with concerns about what's happening in Gaza as anti-Semitic rather than being concerned about what's what's happening in Gaza. Um, so, uh, and the media itself, I mean, it's I think it's been a bit of a mixed picture. Uh, the uh, Murdoch press, you know, Rupert Murdoch, who'd be well known to people in many countries around the world, I guess, uh, controls a large share of the press in Australia, and that has been uh, shrill and um, uh, almost absurdly shrill in its um, in its uh, response to the war. Like, I think there's a headline in today's press by the foreign affairs journalist for the Australian who's been the foreign affairs journalist for the Australian since, like, the 1970s, uh, saying that this is a war, you know, a civilizational war, uh, that Israel is fighting on behalf of whoever he defines as civilised in the world. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, uh, although there's been, uh, I guess, um, general sympathy for the Israeli position in the press, there's also been quite a few people in both the Fairfax Press and the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, so the public broadcaster, who have been a bit more sympathetic. And that in itself, I think, reflects something about this war that uh, 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 that I think I've observed that, you know, we, we had the COVID situation and then we had the Russia situation, the Russia-Ukraine situation a couple of years later, where uh, the entire media world lined up behind a single position. And I think at the onset of the Israel of the latest part of the Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, there was an expectation, I think, that that would happen. But just the, the 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 nature of the events and the depth of the connections and sympathies built up over decades, uh, particularly, you know, obviously with uh, the the sort of uh, West Asian and uh, Muslim communities in Australia, have meant that that consensus has just not been able to hold. And I think that's been reflected around the world um, and people have sort of struggled. I, I think uh, political leaderships have probably struggled to deal with that a little bit because they were expecting it to be another sort of slam dunk <laughs> on, on the on the media end. And then the third now, thing... Uh, Sorry, Jeff. Um, just just very quickly, it did make me, and I'll come back to it later. But mm. um, it, it one thing I have sort of thought a fair bit about, and also discussed with uh, colleagues across the Asia region, is actually how Australia's official position contrasts with the views that seem to be, firstly, the official positions in 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 the governments of countries of our region, um, but also the unofficial public views as well. So, mm. um, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, that's that's absolutely right. 
But then the third thing is partly, I guess, what um, Warwick was uh, pointing to, which is, I mean, these are, a, a, you know, at an ordinary citizen, ordinary you know, member of the public, ordinary viewer, ordinary reader of any of these events, um, incredibly difficult um, events to absorb and think about and deal with. And I think that tends to provoke... Um, you know, too much outrage and too little empathy, I guess, if you like. Uh, and, yeah, and and um, I think in part, um, you know, I know many people in the, uh, well, some people in the Jewish community in Melbourne who are, you know, you know, deeply and uh, legitimately concerned about. Uh, uh, issues of anti-Semitism, um, but at the same time, I just wonder if sometimes that's blinding them to seeing um, the the horrors that are, are, are proceeding. So I, I actually wrote a piece for Pearls and Irritations recently, which um, was called, I think, Gazing at the Gorgon in Gaza, um, and it it, uh, it it was referring to a book written by an Australian historian, Inga Clendinen, uh, from like 1998, uh, called Reading the Holocaust, which is actually, you know, exploring uh, how people have empathetically responded to victims, perpetrators, bystanders, all the, all the whole works uh, during the Holocaust and how difficult that is to do with full imaginative engagement rather than just going off into, um, you know, a bit of a a fairy tale uh, uh, about the events. So, yeah, it, it's been a really uh, difficult process, I think, for people all around the world, really, to actually come to terms with what's going on. One of the things that's so hard to me is to also discern, like, what, how many people do interpret what is going on the way i do and who does it in the uh, on the other on the other side and who's somewhere in the middle because there's to me uh, that's my subjective uh, impression there's a huge divide between the published opinion and public opinion mm -hmm. and i cannot discern anymore like what is what is the actual representation of like what certain communities think i mean uh, we know that the big newspapers in switzerland and germany and in France and the US, they have a very particular framing of the whole situation. And I almost never find very much empathy for the thousands of Palestinians mm. who are dying and for mm. now the Lebanese and so on. And, you know, mm. uh, 50, 60, 70 dead uh, in Lebanon are always, they died because uh, a building collapsed from an explosion, mm. right? Whereas if mm. an Israeli soldier is killed, we've had this this episode where like eight soldiers or 10 soldiers were killed and their faces were were, were on the front page of, of newspapers mm. and they were like killed by Hezbollah, right? There's always this very clear attribution. So there's, there's this obvious bias. But mm. I'm recently also wondering about Twitter. I'm having mm. surprisingly a lot of tweets in my Twitter feed that I wouldn't expect to be there because mm. I have the interpretation of, well, the Palestinians and the, mm. the, the West Asians are like the real victims of like a 100 year onslaught of violence. Mm. And then I now get a lot of feeds um, clearly sympathetic to the Israeli position or only the Israeli position, even mm. interpreting uh, anti-genocide uh, anti slogans like stop, stop the genocide as anti-Semitic, which I find the height of um, mm. a problematic reframing of what's going on. And the fact that Elon Musk, we know, is also now um, mm. is basically well on the on the on on um, at least not on 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 the Palestinian side makes me really question like how far also the social media is now being skewed in order to create certain perceptions about majority groups and minor minority groups. Do you do you guys have um, thoughts look, on this? Yeah, look, even the the, the mere fact that um, in the last 12 months, the nature of the war has in some respects been quite asymmetric, um, but also the nature of the casualties and the deaths has clearly been asymmetric as well, has... Uh, impacted public attitudes too because if there were people who were 
uh, marginally disinterested. And let's face it, there are many people, generally speaking, who would probably not engage in thinking about these issues. They've got other things going on in their lives. But at some point when you've got tens of thousands of people, um, civilians, women, children, um, hospital workers, UN workers um, being killed where reports are coming out of um, uh, of, of children having uh, bullet holes in their heads and through their heart. Uh, these aren't accidents. Right? These are uh, conscious decisions to take out innocent children. That at some point has, I think, provoked a, a an awakening in the wider public that even if they were not deeply conscious of the historical issues at stake, are uh, absolutely disgusted, firstly, with what's going on, with the um, with the with the barbarism and the lack of humanity. But secondly, I think it has also opened up a space within the broader public consciousness consciousness for for the propositions that in fact not only are these behaviors unconscionable and genocidal, but that they are also features of a system that has prevailed globally for some time and which has uh, overseen a, a world that has been deeply unequal, deeply unfair and deeply exploitative of many peoples. And uh, watching that sense of consciousness emerge from people that uh, may have not been engaged at all in the affairs of the world, uh, very much at least, uh, is um, is quite a remarkable thing, right? I mean, the, the sheer scale and the qualitative nature of the horror, I think, has forced people. It's pulled them towards an engagement with the world that they would otherwise not have done. And... We see that on the streets right across the world, as well as here in Australia, but right across the world. Um, there is no letting up. The public demonstrations um, have been growing, not getting less. Um, more people are being drawn to um, marches for peace, marches um, against uh, the continual provision of armaments and weapons and funding to the genociders. Um, and uh, if if there is a a heavily tarnished silver lining in these very very dark clouds, then that possibly is is at least a bit of it. Jeff, um, we've recently learned that Emmanuel Macron actually said no more weapons for Israel. That was a huge mm. news, right? Mm. Um, how was how did you how 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 do you think about that one and how was it kind of received also in, in the wider media in Australia? Um, what, how's the reporting going? Uh, I haven't seen a lot of reporting of how that's gone in, a, in uh, how that's gone in Australia. Um, you know, there seem to be some people who are very sceptical of, you know, um, Emmanuel Macron's attitude. But, uh, I mean, I wonder if it's also just a sign that, you know, um, like Macron's always been an interesting figure, I think, because he's articulated these ideas of, you know, European sovereignty, um, uh, you know, more independence from America, and also, I guess, a more um, capable European Union. I mean, without getting into the arguments one way or the other, I mean, he's talked about a European army and a European you know, a more consolidated political sort of union, whether you think that's good or bad, nonetheless he has a sense of Europe becoming a stronger, more cohesive, I guess, geopolitical entity, let's say. And so, you know, maybe this, these statements on the Israel situation are a small sign of doing that and also a sign of, um, you know, the same... Uh, tensions within France of, you know, they have a significant, uh, uh, you know, Muslim community there, which is not terribly well socially integrated. Um, 
you know, I don't know any sociological facts about it, but just on the basis of all the French television series, I, I consume these constant representations of this. Um, uh, so I wonder if it's partly a kind of a response to that. Um, or and even maybe a reflection that Europe, um, despite some of the headlines, is also considering at different levels how it can maybe just separate itself a little bit from the United States, a little bit like you know, like I watched your very interesting discussion of the Japanese, you know, the new Japanese prime minister, um, his, his uh, comments about uh, Japan, you know, asserting control over its of its military bases uh, again and and in the context of you know supporting the general effort of NATO um actually you know uh, claiming back a little bit of sovereignty for for Japan as a state as well so Thank I wonder you. if if it's you know there's that Europe Europe uh, America tension that is underlying some of the um, comments by Macron Thank you for for bringing that up because uh, that's the sec that's the other topic that we want to talk about. But maybe let's use this this mm. kind of this question that's lingering now in Japan and in Europe. It's like what what's gonna be next with with us and the Americans? Mm. I, I I get this feeling that in a lot of corners people are losing their faith in in long standing maybe not alliance promises but but the 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 habit. Of, mm. of having certain structures like NATO on the one hand, the US-Japan alliance on the other hand, and now the shadow of, of what's <laughs> the Kamala Harris presidency or the Donald Trump presidency, which to a lot of people both seem quite frightening in mm. their own respective ways. But maybe one week again, like, um, what do you? How do you think this is impacting now the the entire the entire like extended West. Yeah, look, the, the global order, I think, um, has actually fundamentally changed, not just being in a process of change, which of course it always is, and not just because right now the nature of the change changes and the speed of changes is perhaps more notice noticeable and greater than a more recent than the more recent past, but that in fact the accumulation of uh, a whole range of developments over the course of the last 30 years or so, maybe a little bit longer, has actually led us to a point where American primacy is actually no longer. And that observation uh, is actually one that is shared by those who wish to um, rekindle or reclaim American primacy. Um, so there are those in the US, in the uh, in the defense or security establishment that um, recognize that American primacy and military preponderance is, is no longer unquestioned. And their view is that uh, the United States needs to muscle up and reclaim a position of primacy. But they accept that there is no primacy today. Together with those who take the view that the loss of American primacy is not something that they can recover from and that the response from the point of view of a more peaceful world is for the United States to recognize its limitations and to become a normal country as opposed to an exceptional country. So I think that that's sort of, for me, the backdrop, this idea, this sense that American preponderance and primacy is um, no longer the, 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 the unquestioned feature of the landscape today. Now, in the face of that, uh, which of course is an experience that uh, many in the relevant policy establishments in different countries have never experienced before. But this is a new phenomenon, but it's a phenomenon to which they must respond. So as I mentioned, some are responding by thinking, my goodness, we need to do what we can to assist the United States reclaim a position of primacy. Then there are those who see this as a window of opportunity to reclaim a little bit of their own lost sovereignty. Uh, and I think we see that amongst the Japanese and people may have a very critical reaction to that or a very concerned reaction to the re-emergence of um, Japanese uh, militarism and, and nationalism. But 
no doubt, I think, from the point of view of uh, many in the Japanese political establishment, the decline in American primacy is a window of opportunity. And ditto, I think, the Europeans are crab walking towards that conclusion too. So, you know, Macron, as Jeff intimated, uh, often says words that sound like the right thing, so to speak, uh, even if uh, he also says the other thing as well. I think in French there is a, a phrase that people in France use, and I don't know what it is in French, but um, it's essentially something like, you know, Macron is the is the on the one hand this and on the on the other hand that kind of guy. And, and I think we get a bit of that um, in this space. But nonetheless, there is a dawning realisation that um, that the United States really is not going to be able to fulfil the same kind of role that it has historically in the context of a European security architecture uh, going forward. So what's the response? Well, some, of course, are clinging to NATO as, you know, as, as the way forward. But... I'm not convinced that the major states, even though they say that rhetorically, actually have their heart in that as their only strategic response. And they're starting to think through alternatives. The Japanese clearly are. They're clearly trying to uh, widen the envelope for a little bit more Japanese autonomy than has been the case historically. Whether they can do that or not is always a different question. But there's no doubt that there is... A, um, a a strategic attempt to think through what the alternative possibilities are when American primacy is no longer. Yeah, and the, the Japanese Prime Minister tries to frame this new approach in 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 known terms, right, uh, Jeff? Like it's so it's so interesting mm -hmm. that he was proposing a. Asian NATO and the, mm. the response has like been quite negative from the beginning, but I, I'm mm. not sure whether how happy Australia was about this idea being floated out there. I mean, we had Asian NATO, it was Seattle and it collapsed in mm. 77, I believe, because like everybody withdrew. And um, on the other hand, the new prime minister also uh, suggested that there should be, a, you know, reciprocity I mean, the among the Japanese and the Americans. So if the Americans have like bases with US troops in Japan, there should be Japanese troops on on Japanese bases in the US. <laughs> mm. Mm. What did you make yeah. out of that when you when you heard about this news and, and also the NATO idea? Uh, well, I think on the uh, on the I mean, it seemed to me that the Japanese Prime Minister appears to be just acting like a skillful diplomat of trying to advance, um, you know, limited and achievable objectives for his country um, uh, in a way that will not. Um, you know, scare the horses or alienate the great and powerful friend. Uh, so presenting um, uh, uh, a change that will appear to be in the American interest while while uh, claiming what he what he can. So um, if he's able to carry it off, good on him. And uh, I mean, you know, I, I think and certainly you spoke about this in your interview. The the culture in Japan is deeply different to 1930s, 1940s Japan. I, I don't really think the world needs to worry about Japanese militarism or, or anything like that. And I think a Japan that is more assertive, vibrant, and, um, you know, has a greater role in the world is part of the, you know, uh, you know to use the phrase, the multipolar world. I think that's part of it. I mean, I still remember all those paranoid movies from the 80s and 90s from America about, you know, all the you know, Japanese taking over the world and, you know, enslaving Americans, like Dark Rain and all those utterly atrocious, um, you know, not even borderline racist uh, movies um, out, of, out of Hollywood. So, I mean, I think that's probably a good thing and it's probably a sign also that the um the the capability of america to exercise its primacy is is evidently failing around the world so countries are adopting different strategies of how to do it in australia we've adopted the strategy of trying to convince america that it can do everything it wants and you know we'll do everything they want us to do and and spend 400 billion dollars or whatever it is on 
uh, submarines that we'll never get. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Japan, it seems to be taking a craftier attitude, both in terms of how it's managing, as I understand it, some of its financial risks uh, in relationship to the US dollar. Warwick might understand all that better than me, but uh, also in this sort of military side of things. And then in terms of Asian NATO, again, I think that, I mean, it's, you know, um, NATO, um, when NATO was formed, Japan was a military governorship of the United States run by General MacArthur. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I think NATO was part of the Korean War, if I remember correctly. Uh, in my view, I, NATO has always been involved in Asia. It's been 80 years now since, uh, you know, the United States has occupied, militarily occupied, the West Pacific and Europe. Uh, it, it just can't go on forever like that. And so over time, uh, that, that exposure is going to have to change and the states that are, you know, in those regions, I think we'll need to sort of be more assertive about their their both economic and their their sort of military situation. Warwick, do you think Na uh, Asian NATO is a dead on arrival idea? Look, I think in the way that it was presented, it's dead on arrival in large part because I think it was a, um, a means by which um, Ishiba could flag a couple of things. Um, one was the idea that the Japan-United States relationship was asymmetric and that needed to change. Um, well, that's probably not going to change this time around, certainly not in the way that Ashiba proposed it, because not only was he talking about the location of Japanese troops on Japanese bases on Guam, um, he also um, proposed that that be, be achieved on the same conditions that uh, U.S. troops are in you know, on bases in Japan, namely that there is extraterritorial provisions, um, and, and uh, that idea I think would go down like a lead balloon in Washington, and so it has. But I think what it also has done is that it's it's enabled the pushing of the envelope. Uh, so sometimes um, positions are advanced not because you think you can achieve them today, but because they open up a way to achieve something else that may be a little bit more incremental, but nonetheless is something that contributes to uh, your broader agenda. And if we think back over the course of the last 10 years, and in a recent speech actually in the United States with Ashiba's predecessor was hosted um, as part of the, the uh, trilateral discussions with the Philippines, uh, he spoke very carefully and I think quite um, uh, cunningly, if you will, uh, about the fact that America's provided a security umbrella for Asia, I'm paraphrasing, of course, um, but uh, and has done all the good things, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, and we're all grateful for that, but we also know that America can't do it on its own. It's awfully unfair to expect America to do it on its own, but don't you worry, we're here to help fill the gap. And I think that that's the space that, Mm -hmm. these initiatives are seeking to push open, to pry open and to push that envelope just that little bit further. Um, I think that uh, uh, whilst there whilst there will be different assessments of the risks and probabilities of Japanese militarization and those sorts of things, but certainly there are parts of the populations across Asia that nonetheless um, have their historic memories of either their own experiences or the experiences of their grandparents uh, reignited in terms of uh, the, the atrocities of um, of uh, the, the Japanese Imperial Army throughout the Second World War and prior to the Second World War. So all of those things, I think, make this idea of an Asian NATO where Japan plays um, equal equal fiddle with the United States dead on arrival. The um, uh, and and oddly, I think it it it, it funnily may. Uh, achieve in a very small way, but nonetheless one that will sit in the memories of some. Uh, it's a it's a trifecta where Washington's put offside a little bit, um, uh, Southeast Asian nations are put offside a bit, and China's put offside a bit. 
and um, and that's all happened with one one move. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's a lot that we could go into exploring of how serious these ideas are or how likely they are, but like th that's not even the point. I find it most interesting now, like in this discussion, to just also contest to to. to realize again that we are in an in a, some sort of in between position where this realignment is happening all over the globe of 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 people trying to position or states trying to position themselves but one thing and i i would like to check with your perception is that what we are not seeing and correct me if i'm wrong but what we are not seeing is a galvanizing around new alliances right the only big alliance around is really NATO, and there was this huge talk two and a half years ago when the when the uh, war, uh, the Ukraine war started. Oh, um, China and Russia are now in a hard alliance. They're now alliance building. They're going to be the antipode and so on. But that didn't really happen. The only kind of hard alliance building that we saw is Russia with North Korea. They seem to have a new security mm. um, structure. We it's possible now that Iran is happening with Russia. But um, even if we look at how Iran with its allies worked, Hamas and, and Hezbollah, what we are seeing is that they didn't intervene. I mean, it's not this kind of first world war scenario where country after country is going to be dragged in because its allies get caught no. up. And it seems also in Asia, that uh, in, in East Asia, that the, the, general, as the general movement is not towards alliances. It's more toward independent positions, mm. more of them either explicitly or implicitly. Would you agree with me on that assessment? Maybe first, Jeff, and then uh, what would... Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, as you're talking, uh, you know, in many ways I feel we're watching the slow crumbling of the post-1945 world, and in a way NATO is the sort of central remaining military uh, alliance established at the start of the post-1945 world. Uh, and as you say, there's not really a, a clear mm, uh, opposing alliance at all. Um, but we're seeing the, uh, I mean, what I, I describe it as like the tides of globalisation have changed, that, that you know, globalisation as a process of like long distance the exchange of ideas, people, resources has something that has happened in different ways over centuries and centuries and centuries. The globalization we've witnessed since 1991 has been a very particular form of globalization where it's basically been westernization or Americanization. And I just think that that has just because of the new distribution of uh, people, resources, ideas, money, power, influence, uh, energy, initiative. Uh, the world is so fundamentally different now. Um, you know, like the other day, there was some news about uh, China jumping uh, some sort of step in the sort of silicon chip. Uh, there's huge cultural exchanges. The role of India diplomatically is fundamentally different. And, you know, um, the rest of the world is talking back to the West and saying, sorry, guys, you know, you, you, you don't define the terms of our conversation anymore. Uh, we've got something to contribute. Um, and so, but we're also seeing it in the financial world, the, you know, the, 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 all the money stuff that I don't really understand, but is clearly changing in some way, and the, just the relative weights of the economies. Um, perhaps the one place we're not seeing it is, you know, the whole communications environment, which is so, so dominated by, um, you know, American technology platforms. But in a way, that's also been part of the story of American globalisation since the 1990s because it coincided with the internet and you really could believe that you could just sort of stream the world from, you know, the Situation Room in Washington and it was an accurate representation of everything. And uh, I think that's even breaking down and perhaps that's also why we're seeing some of this very extreme um, a reaction like with the Glenn Deason affair and all that sort of thing as well. So uh, I, I think uh, I 
I've sort of forgotten the question you initially asked me, but I, I do feel that we are in a really critical period where the outcome is not really known, but we're clearly moving away from a lot of the institutional structures that have held the world together some way or, or another. Uh, and I just hope that they, they uh, some new ones form without us, uh, you know, killing ourselves. And the other question is like, is it, we are not moving towards more uh, alliance building. Mm -hmm. We are moving more towards new institution and network yep. building also like globally. Uh, yeah, globally. exactly. Do you see it like that? Yeah, I, I, I think people or, or many countries are very mindful of the old lessons coming from, you know, the international relations slash security thinking from many decades ago, which is that alliance forming in times of peace is actually very dangerous because it presupposes the definition of, of an enemy. And needless to say, when you do that, you create the conditions for the the classic security dilemma problems right so um, in in pursuing security through alliance building you create the conditions of instability and most nations um, are very mindful of those um, those risks and I think we are seeing a an approach which is far more about diversification of networks rather than obvious uh, uh, bifurcated alliance structures and mindsets and and it's the idea that through this multitude of networks that fabrics are woven so you know if i stick to the analogy of of networks and fabrics and linkages the the hope is that what gets created uh, may be a, a at one level, of not a particularly attractive tapestry because it wasn't really done to any particular design, but nonetheless, it's a very robust and strong tapestry that uh, has all of the participating nodes quite locked into the maintenance of the stability of that tapestry structure. And through that alignment of interests in the network itself, the possibilities of security being indivisible become real i think the other thing that we're only starting to see now is, well two things one is a way of thinking about relationships between nations that uh, seeks to put the question of the relationships at the heart of the discussions as opposed to putting individual nations as the as the principal objects of analysis and policy prescription and that is based on the idea that nations exist fundamentally and in an ontological sense only by virtue of their relationships with the rest of the world. So you can't treat individual nations outside of the context of their connections and therefore uh, addressing concerns of nations can only be done so by addressing the context in which they are connected to others. In parallel to that, there is also, I think, a, a, a nascent re-emergence of an attempt. So, I mean, that's pretty clumsy, right? It's a clumsy way of saying, I think it's very embryonic. Uh, an attempt to reclaim the positive peace legacy of Bandung and the, um, uh, the non-aligned movement ethos as a way of talking constructively about institution building for peace and prosperity, rather than framing national priorities in a negative sense, which is how do we create alliances as a way of defending and protecting. So those are some of the, the emerging elements of a world that is a bit different to how the dominant features have been for some time. How that plays out, well, you know, Time, time will always tell, won't it, Jeff? Time mm. will always tell. Um, and look, we'll work to connect it to some of the earlier discussion as well. Like, you know, I think, uh, I mean, you can't get peace unless you talk with strangers and with your enemy, um, so to speak, or at least your rival. Uh, and we seem to have lost the art of um, talking to uh, stranger countries, enemy countries, uh, other countries, 
both in foreign affairs, but sometimes it seems even within our own domestic politics, it's always ratcheted up to good and evil, us versus them um, type dialogues where, um, you know, you cannot possibly say, you know, maybe there's a bit of balance on both sides and maybe there's a compromise somewhere in the middle and <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, well, uh, the conditions of dialogue are actually destroyed, aren't they? Because yeah. once the world is framed in that millenarian sense, black mm -hmm. versus white, good versus evil, it is actually impossible to have functional dialogue. Mm. Right. And, and, that, and, and that is the whole point of this war narrative and war logic. It tries mm. to shut down uh, intelligent discussion and intelligible mm. discussion mm. Uh, and uh, in order to then create the, the, the ground for, the, for this warfare. That's why, like, when I was talking to uh, Glenn Deeson yep. the other day, I just said, mm. like, you know, the most dissident thing we can do is just to reject mm. stupidification. Well, just don't yeah. just, well, like, be well, aware well, you... that the world is complex. Yeah. Can, can can you imagine being a dissident simply by saying that statecraft matters? I mean, how, how dissident is that? But mm. in a world where the discourse or the acceptable space for discourse has been narrowed to this question of uh, defining warfare and who one's enemy is, then it is actually impossible to extricate yourself from that position. The only way out is to either win or lose. Right, in a very definitive sense. And, you know, that uh, people and places pay big prices for that um, and arguably unnecessary prices for that when there may be, if we could actually open up the space for a different sense of human imagination for pathways that actually get us somewhere um, that is acceptable um, with, with, with a hell of a lot less bloodshed along the way, um, let alone, well, in addition to the the destruction of the material world around us, and um, but yeah, look, the idea that being a dissident is saying, "Hey, look, guys, how about we uh, think beyond framing the world as simply in simply friend enemy terms?" And if Absolutely. that's a dissident view, then I'm hopeful that there are more dissidents amongst us. Mm -hmm. And that is why I have I put a lot of hope into the next year, uh, 2025 is going to be the seventieth anniversary since Bandung and we better celebrate that and we better try to keep up that spirit um, we are nearing the end um, I would like to thank you both Jeff Rich and Warwick Powell people can find you uh, Jeff on the Burning Archive uh, Warwick people best find you on X and on Substack X on Substack um, and um, yeah that's a good start Pascal that's a good start the other thing of course is um, is what we do collectively in a loose um, alliance network kind of way is, is our shared commitment to this idea that we can all contribute to a multipolar piece, right? And I guess that's what part of this conversation is about too. Yeah. Uh, decentralized multipolar peace. Jeff and Warwick, yep. thank you very much for today. Thank you, Great Pascal. To be with you.